over many, many years, these potatoes have come into us, and they came in um, lots of times. And so we ended up with like a couple of hundred potatoes in our collection. And then about three years ago, we got this thing in New Zealand called the psyllid, which has come in from somewhere overseas, and it's a little bug that sucks the sap of the potatoes, sucks the leaves, and it puts viruses in there. And so a lot of people lost their potato collections three years ago in New Zealand. But slowly leading up to that time in this country, we've been through a period since the Second World War where people haven't done, home gardeners haven't done a very good job of saving our own potato seeds because we've all been happy to be dependent on the ones at the, soup, at the garden centres and at farmlands and everywhere where they sell them commercially. And we've stopped like doing a good job of saving our own seed potatoes. I think a lot of people don't even know you can save your own seed potatoes. They think you've got to buy them. And the people who sell them do a good job of persuading us that we should buy them because they're virus free and da 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 and da da da. So three years ago when the psyllid came, our heritage potatoes were in a very, very low place already because we'd done such a bad job of selection and saving them for seed. So they were full of viruses already and quite um, not cropping like they used to, not having, I mean, that's a sign of a virus anyway, is having low, small crops. So at the point where the psyllid arrived and suddenly everyone's potatoes are getting wiped out and they're harvesting little marbles that you can't even eat and people are freaking out, like there was two reactions in this country. One of them was, in fact, apart from us, everyone had this other reaction, oh, let's take our potatoes to the laboratory and get them tissue cultured to get the viruses out. So I'd already been involved with the Coomera collection in New Zealand and I already knew that the likely outcome of keeping our potatoes virus-free by doing it in a laboratory is not going to work in the long run. Like, it doesn't actually encourage our potatoes to learn to be disease-resistant or to develop in that process of co-evolution in relationship to their environment or the psyllids or anything else. So I went the other way, the way that epigenetics tells us ought to work. If environment determines genetic expression, then we provide our potatoes with the best possible environment we can, we ought to be able to improve their health as well as go through a staunch selection process. So that, this is the fifth year that we've done this with these potatoes. We started off with wildly varying, um, like each different cultivar. This, we started off with about 50 cultivars. Um, each cultivar, wild variations within it, very low production. And we've improved them every year. And we've done that by working with environmental fertilizers. And Grant's helped us with a recipe for the best possible nutrition. And we've done that and we've learned a few other things along the way like when the best time is to plant them here and that they they like cool roots so they need to be mulched and they need to be moist all the time and they hate the hot in the summer here so you need to be protecting them from we, we've got mulch. So we've learned a few other things and we've learned how to rogue them and we've done a pretty good job of it but this year we want to do a really 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 good job. So. Um, what we're going to do is for each of these cultivars, a cultivar is like an individual variety. So we've got, we've got about just over 30 distinct cultivars and that's less than we did have because we've, since we've been doing this trial over the last four years, we've learned that actually this one's the same as this one. And we've specifically looked at that over a few years in a row and seen, well, actually, we're going to amalgamate those two because it's, we, have, we can't afford to keep growing lots of different grow-outs of the same potato. So we've amalgamated some lines. We've lost a couple of lines that were really weak and we haven't been able to save. So now we're about to plant them again this year. So I always like to talk about it because our potato collection is like a collection of potatoes that's come to this land with almost every group of people that ever came here. So I believe we have pre-European potatoes in this collection. There are four, I think there are four potato lines in here that came before there were any Europeans here. Um, that's one of them. Uririka. It's very purple in the middle. It's like that. Um, there are, there's Kararo. This is another one. This is my favourite. You probably can't tell much about it by looking at it like that. Um, anyway, we'll, I can show you them later. So 
Um, the, the key thing about this collection for me is that potatoes have been a really important part of the diets of many of our, our ancestors, especially our European ancestors, but they also came via South America from South, I mean they're all from South America, but some of the waka that came here before the, any of the Europeans came with potatoes, I believe. I've been told stories, I've been told they were, and I believe that, they're significantly different to all the others. And then they came with them early whalers and sealers, they came with the missionaries, they came with immigrants from just about every country in Europe. By then potatoes were all, well, you know, the whole story about the potato famine and what happened all through Europe. Um, I think even today people try to come into New Zealand with their own potatoes. You see things in the paper every now and again, someone got caught in customs with... one. Ma oh, there was a big thing in the paper one day about a man from Scotland who got busted with his Scottish potatoes and I laughed because we got them in our collection, they're already here. Mm -hmm. But he didn't know that. So anyway, every year when we plant the potatoes we think of all of our ancestors, all of our people who came here over the hundreds of years that people have been coming here and with the, and and their stories are all in these potatoes and um, these so these potatoes nourish us in in many ways and including like just reminding us of our whakapapa and our ancestors and what they how they lived and 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 how what they passed on down to us when we eat the food of our own ancestors our bodies rem our bodies recognize it and on a, at a cellular level the level of our DNA they are able to communicate with it more strongly so it nourishes us more fully than the food of than any other food so these are really important parts of our seed collection and there's about 30 odd 32 35 odd cultivars here so today what we're going to do part of the process of keeping these so it's really difficult for us to do this because it costs a lot to run this trial there's a lot of attention paid to it, and um, as you're going to see now, just the planting is going to be a big process. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to dip all of these for about a couple of minutes in compost tea. Um, and then we're going to put each cultivar separately into a bag and shake it very gently with some seedling inoculant, which is basically microbes. So the idea of the compost tea and the microbes is to get the healthiest collection of microbes on the potatoes as possible because potatoes are quite susceptible to a fungal diseases so that's the first step at this point of the year the next step is to prepare the beds and we're going to put we're going to use that um, wheel hoe to put trenches in the beds in the bottom of the trenches we're going to put we're going to put the biochar down we're going to put the fertilizer in the nanocal the soil mag and the nature's garden then we're going to put the potatoes at 30 centimetre spacings along those rows and then we're going to cover them and then we're going to, in a watering can, put activated carbon, which is fine biochar, and fish and seaweed and do a soil drench on top. So that's fungi food and it's just heaps of goodies. And then when they come up we'll probably do a fortnightly compost tea and on the in-between weeks we'll do foliar feeding. The first foliar feed will be growth foliar, but we only do that once with potatoes. As soon as they're flushing with their growth, which they will be after the first feed, we switch to the fruit foliar. So it's, and then when we harvest them, this is where a lot of the work is. When we, so we, we're going to rogue them as they grow. If there's anything with lots of wrinkled leaves or yellow blotches, we'll be roguing them out. And then, um, and we'll be keeping them moist, we have drippers on them and we'll be watching them carefully, hilling them up, mulching them. And then when we harvest them at the end of the season, we harvest every single potato plant separately. And we weigh the potatoes under every plant so that we know how even the lines are and how many potatoes they're producing and what the average is. And then we save the seed from the best potatoes the healthiest and highest cropping to save for our mother seed for the following year so it's like an enormous amount of um, admin and paperwork so um, we we get we run this as a sponsorship trial so we get our members and followers to help pay for it 